You already learned from Randy how higher temperatures and higher, higher carbon dioxide concentrations will influence plants in agriculture, so I'm not going to repeat that. But there are also indirect effects of a hotter planet on agriculture, and that's what I want to talk about today. And yes, you probably guessed it, some of these indirect effects have to do with the organisms that plants interact with, both the good and the bad. So let's explore how this works. We spent some time talking about insects as some of the key competitors to us because they want to get at our plants too. Unlike us, insects are what we call cold-blooded or ectotherms. That is, for the most part, they don't have the ability, as you and I do, to maintain body temperature. If it's cold outside, their body temperature is low. If the temperature gets too low, they might actually freeze and die. When it's warm outside, they're also warm. But if it gets too hot, they'll cook and they'll also die. Insects are small and their surface area to volume ratio is high, which means they're constantly fighting this heat loss and gain. Just like you and I, insects have various behavioral ways of avoiding these temperature extremes. They can find or create shelters. They can get together in groups to control the environment. And some have physiological ways to make sure they don't freeze. Actually, they actually make antifreeze molecules that allow them to make it through even some of the most bitter winters, 20 or 30 below centigrade. But for the most part, when we crank up the temperature, their development speeds up. They can go through their life cycles faster, they eat quicker, and everything kind of speeds up. This means that if global temperatures increase, where in the environment they can live within their thermal tol tolerances is also going to change. So let's take a look at this little beetle here, the small but devastating coffee berry borer. This beetle is native to Eastern Africa and feeds as larvae, these little white maggots here, within the berries of the coffee. It has now spread to most coffee producing uh, countries in the world. The first report of it in the Americas was in Brazil in the 1920s. Uh, by the 1970s, it had reached Central America, Guatemala, Mexico, big coffee producing regions, and it found its way to Hawaii in 2010. This beetle has a typical developmental response to temperature. As you crank up the temperature, their developmental rates increase in this very nice linear fashion. Above this certain, certain threshold here, they don't do so well. This is about 30 degrees centigrade or 86 Fahrenheit. And below 15 centigrade or about 60 degrees, they also can't develop. It's just too cold. And what researchers who have been studying this particular insect in Ethiopia found was that prior to 1984, it was actually hard for the insect to go through one full generation from egg through to the larval stage to pupation and back to the adult stage. After 1984, they were these beetles were easily able to get one generation in, and actually when the adults emerged, it was still warm enough for them to mate and have a full second generation. So if you're a farmer in this area, climate change is gonna have a big effect. Pests are able to crank through more generations and eat your crops for a longer period of time than before. And this is just temperature dependent. And what these researchers were also able to do with the extensive data, data that they had about the beetle's development was to compare the climate conditions in the area and make a prediction about where these beetles should be able to do well. If they knew that it was gonna to be too hot, then this beetle is likely not gonna do very well. It just won't be, won't be present. Or if it's too cold or cold for too long, they won't develop fast enough and they shouldn't be very common. So here's a map of Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi. And this is where the, they predicted that these coffee pests would also be most likely to occur given the historical climatic records of the last 30 years. In red are the areas where the suitability is the highest, followed by the orange and all the way down to the white areas that are relatively unfavorable for them. So you can kind of map out where this pest is gonna be common just based on the thermal relationships. What they were then able to do was do some climate projections about for this area where they could use information about the predicted temperature and precipitation in the future 
and so on for the year uh, 2050. And this is the map of their predicted distribution. Some areas are gonna become unsuitable, but mostly there are gonna be new areas that are, gonna, that are becoming fair game for these beetles, especially up the sides of the mountains where it was once too cold for their development, but now actually are within those, uh, those perfect developmental ranges. And based on their predictions, these beetles can now have five to as many as 10 generations during the coffee growing season. And the prediction is that there could be as much as a 10% loss in coffee production where these beetles uh, are available. And that's a lot. In these countries here where smallholder farmers depend on this cash crop, we're talking about a major effect on the livelihoods of farmers. Given the sensitivity of these beetles to temperature, it might be possible to consider some agronomic approaches to lowering the thermal environment in which these crops grow, perhaps growing uh, coffee in the shade as shade grown uh, coffee. So let's take a look at another group of insects this time, bumblebees. Our fuzzy flower loving friends that collect and eat pollen and nectar and in the process pollinate plants including our crops. Species in this group of insects belong to a single genus that is mostly found in temperate areas and in the mountain re mountainous regions of the world. They're cold tolerant, having this big coat of insulation, and they're one group of insects that can actually increase their body temperature above the ambient levels, and they do so by shivering. Check out this awesome video here with the incomparable Sir Richard Attenborough uh, showing some examples of this. The long trumpets of the daffodils retain heat very well, and they're still warm even after their hot-bodied visitors have left. So what will happen to bumblebees in a world where temperatures are rising? Well, you might predict that at their southern edge of their ranges, it will get hotter than it already is, and bees will slowly edge further north to find a better fit for their temperature profiles, or they will just perish as it gets too hot. At the northern edge of their ranges, conditions that were once too cold should now open up for opportunities for colonization. So basically we should see these ranges of insects shifting northwards as the climate gets warmer. <laughs> so that's one prediction of how climate change is gonna affect the ranges of insects. This study here by Jeremy Kerr at the University of Ottawa tried to see if there was any evidence for this. And what they found looks something like this. Indeed, if you look at the southern edges of a distribution of, a, of the species as they were between 1900 and 1974, and you compare it to where it is now in the last decade, what we see is that bees that were further south, where, where it was warmer, shifted north the most. This is almost 200 kilometers for some species. However, at the northern edge of the range, they don't seem to have changed much. So what's happening is that the species ranges actually are getting squeezed. So even though the climate conditions are expected to be more favorable further north, the species don't seem to have the capacity to track these more favorable climates. Or perhaps as they get there, things like food or nesting habitats are actually not there for them. You can take this approach one step further as they did and actually make some predictions about the species distributions giving future climates. So that study, that previous study was about what have we seen so far? This one here is about let's project things out 50 years and let's see what happens. So let's see what we might predict. And what they conclude is that some species will eventually migrate north and therefore some regions in these more northern latitudes will see an increase in the number of species, number of bumblebee species. Other areas in the south, on the other hand, will lose them, and they lose them at a greater rate than those that are gained in the north, as the climate becomes more unsuitable at these, northern, at these southern edges. And this is consistent with the previous findings that bumblebees just can't perfectly keep up with the changing pace of the climate. So while you and I might be able to pack up and move when we don't like the weather, or in the short term, we can turn on the heat or the air conditioning if we live in a place with it or if we can afford it. 
Bumblebees, on the other hand, just can't disperse quickly enough to match that changing uh, climate. So one approach that people have actually talked about in terms of mitigating these effects of climate change might be to actually pick the species up and move them hundreds of miles north into areas where the climate might be more suitable. This is called assisted migration. It's, so far it's just talked about it, but it's really not been uh, being done yet. Bumblebees are only one group of insects that pollinate plants, and we don't really know what how other species, other bee species, might react to increasing temperatures. So there's actually great concern about what this will mean for the ability of insects that pollinate crops and actually plants in natural habitats as well. This is especially concerning for plants that actually have very few pollinators. Many pollinator dependent crops, however, often depend on a range of broadly generalized bee species like honeybees. So maybe this effect will be felt a little less intensely for some crops. And yet the loss of wild bees might, be, might mean the loss of that biological diversity that Randy talked about that gives us that portfolio effect, that gives us that diversification effect. And that really, you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to pollinators as well. And so losing species or having species change in their distributions as a consequence of climate change might, uh, might have consequences for, uh, for the role that biodiversity plays in agricultural systems. One thing that's also predicted to change as, climates, uh, as global climates change is that springs will arrive earlier and falls will, uh, will come later. If plants flower at times when insects that pollinate them are not around, maybe because plants have different sensitivities to temperature than insects do, then there may be a mismatch between the flowers and their pollinators. And this could spell bad news for pollinator dependent crops because of what we refer to as a phenological mismatch. So there's lots of ways that are temperature and also precipitation driven that affect those organisms that are important to, uh, to agriculture, that biodiversity that contributes to the functioning of our agricultural systems whether we look at it from the perspective of pests and what pests are gonna do, or if we look at it from the perspective of those beneficial insects and what they might be able to do.